Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Heckman. I'm the Bexley Public Library Director, and I want to welcome you all here in person and online. I think I'm looking at the right one. Hi. Uh, we're excited to have everybody here tonight. We have a great program. We like to say that uh, the library, your library, is where curiosity meets discovery, and tonight's program certainly is a fine example of that. Uh, this program tonight comes with some great community partnerships of the, uh, the Ohio State University Department of History and with our wonderful friends and neighbor across the street, Gramercy Books. Uh, so I want to welcome you all to the library and come up here and introduce uh, Linda Cass. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and thanks really to the willingness of the Bexley Library uh, to be our venue host when the number of registrants for this event surpassed our space at, um, at Gramercy Books. And how wonderful is it to have a bookstore and a library across the street from one another. Um, I'd like to also welcome our live audience and our 100 people viewing online tonight. Gramercy Books is just thrilled to feature National Book Award winner Kevin Boyle and his remarkable book, The Shattering America in the 1960s. Uh, and we're, we're equally excited and grateful to have Kevin in conversation with another esteemed historian, Hassan Jeffries. And in fact, The Shattering has its roots in a course on the 1960s that Kevin first offered at Ohio State in 2006 when he was a faculty member in the university's acclaimed history department. And I want to take a moment to recognize Ohio State University's History Department and its chair, Scott Levy, for joining with Gramercy Books and the Bexley Library to present tonight's program. So to preview the next hour for you, after my introductions, Hassan and, and Kevin will discuss the shattering for about 35 minutes. There then will be about 15 to 20 minutes for your questions, and you can come down the middle of the aisle. This microphone will be positioned there. For the online audience, I want you to feel comfortable to also ask questions. Uh, you would, if you would please put them in capital letters in the chat box, um, we will uh, ask as many questions as we can of yours as well. And Finally, Kevin will sign copies of The Shattering following the program. So just to tell you, Gramercy Books continues to offer uh, virtual, hybrid, and intimate in-person uh, events as we are tonight. Um, as you know, we um, trying at this point of COVID, trying to ensure the safety uh, for everyone. And we, you know, in, uh, have masks and proof of uh, full vaccination required, and we limit our seating um, for any of the in-person events. And you can find our full um, author programming um, at our website, GramercyBooksBexley.com. And I just want to give a shout out to one program later this month where seats are still available. And it'll be on Thursday, February 17th. Number uh, one New York Times bestselling author, Daniel Pink, will be in, con and he's a Bexley original uh, uh, lived in Bexley, grew up in Bexley, went to Bexley High School. Um, he'll be in conversation with Pelotonia CEO, Doug Ullman, to discuss his uh, Pink's seventh book, The Power of Regret, about the transforming power of our most misunderstood, yet potentially most valuable emotion. And this event will be held at the Drexel Theater. It will also be live streamed. And now on to tonight's program. The Shattering, America in the 1960s, is a masterful history of the decade focusing on the period's fierce conflicts over race, sex, and war. Conflicts that shattered America's post-war order and divide us still. Kevin Boyle is the author of Arc of Justice, winner of the National Book Award for Nonfiction, the Chicago Tribune's Heartland Prize, the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Tolerance Book Award, and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He has published essays and reviews in the Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, among others. He's received fellowships from the Rockefeller, Fulbright, and Guggenheim Foundations, as well as from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Andrew Carnegie Corporation. Kevin is the William Smith Mason Professor of American History at Northwestern University and lives in Evanston, Illinois. And we're thrilled to have you back, Kevin. 
Hassan Jeffries is an esteemed history professor at The Ohio State University and an expert in African American history. He's the editor of Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement and author of Bloody Louds, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. He has received several fellowships in support of his research, including a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship. He has also regularly shared his expert knowledge of African American history and contemporary <laughs> Black politics with the general public through lectures, teacher workshops, and frequent media appearances, including his very powerful TEDx talk, Confronting Hard History. Thanks for being tonight's moderator, Hassan. Let's give a warm welcome now for Hassan Jeffries and Kevin Boyle. Well, Linda, thank you very much. Thank you, Gramercy. Thank you, Bexley Public Library. Um, Scott, thank you, History Department uh, at The Ohio State University for, for bringing Kevin back so we can have this conversation. Look, before we, before we dive in, before I ask you any questions, this is, this is a homecoming. Um, and I, I want to give you a chance at least to say hello uh, before we get into the meat of things. I really appreciate that. So I have a couple of things. So I can't match having grown up in Bexley because we did. Um, <laughs> I did live in Bexley for 50 and I am our daughter which is Bexley for 11 years. And so it's really exciting to me that this event is being hosted by um, two institutions I think of, gosh, what can you think? think of as my home, um, the Bexley Public Library mm. and the Ohio State History thank Department. Thank you. Um, and then there's just three people that I really want to thank for making this evening possible. My friend, Linda Cass, who very generously set everything up. Um, my friend, Brigitte Solon, who actually put in all the work and the original call to say, why don't you have something here? Um, <laughs> Uh, and Vicky, of course, for everything. Oh, and a fourth person, and Hassan, um, who we met when you first arrived at OSU, and I think it might have been my first or second year mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so I'm really, really honored and very grateful that you would do this tonight. Absolutely. Well, welcome back. Thank uh, you. And welcome back, Vicky. I didn't see you over there. Great to, <laughs> great to have you back. And for all, we, we've heard it here, for all of the very good white folk up in Olentangy, who are mad at me about critical race theory. If it, <laughs> if it wasn't for this white dude, I wouldn't be here. So it, not my fault, blame him. That's not true. Blame him, blame him. So what you're really saying is you would have been home watching TV, which is it's really- totally <laughs> I, would I would totally, totally. <laughs> All right, so the shattering, the shattering. You know, there's, there's a lot in a title. There's a lot in you know, what we choose to name yeah. our work and what we choose to name uh, the books that we do. Two questions. Did you choose, did you settle on a title before, during, or after you had written the book? And why the shattering? So I did not have a title. I hate titles. I, I find finding a title for a book is one of the most god-awful experiences. <laughs> um, this is not your question. I promise I'll answer it. But I, the previous book, Arc of Justice, that didn't have a title till like a couple of months before it was published. And to this day, it's the wrong title. Mm. Um, with this one, it had various titles. And then somewhere along the line in the writing, I settled on the shattering. And again, I'm not completely convinced it's the right title. Mm. There was a shattering in the 1960s. And that's one of the really big points of the book. But it was a partial shattering. Mm. So what the book tried, what I try to do with the book is to say that there was a particular political configuration in the United States in the 1950s. It's not a consensus. A consensus, which is the common way people talk about it. A consensus implies everyone bought into it. This was a particular political configuration that was bounded by racial restrictions, that was tied to the military industrial complex that embraced a very um, parochial sense of morality and excluded a lot of people. And what happened in the 60s is that people tried to bring that system down, those restrictions down, and some of them fell mm. and others didn't. 
but somehow a book that you're trying to sell that you call the partial shattering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it kind of loses something. <laughs> so that's where the title comes from. And as you said, this is a, a story of a telling of the 1960s. When do the 60s begin? It's been a big question for historians. Where do you start the 60s? Where do you end the 1960s? I'm arguing that, well, it depends which part of the story you want to look at. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, as a general sense, from the late, from the mid 50s onward, mm -hmm. the, particularly the struggle over race gains momentum. I've been, I'm trying to say in the book that there was a civil rights movement, not original to me, as you well know. There was a civil rights movement long before the 1950s. One of the common stories of the 19 of American history in the popular memory, right, is that civil rights movement started when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat in the bus. Well, there's a, my argument is there's a good 50 year period before that, but it does accelerate. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of start for me of the 1960s is that acceleration that comes with Montgomery that comes with Little Rock, really, which is a, in some ways a more important, way more important moment, I think. And then the challenge to kind of that parochial um, set of sexual moralities also start, well, that's been going on for a long time, but it also accelerates in this period. So I'd say if I have to put a date on it, somewhere in the latter half of the 1950s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a lot, as you said, there's a lot going on in this extended decade, if you will. And you as the author have to choose yeah. sort of what to focus on both sort of in terms of large themes. And, and you, you lay out very early on, there's sort of three themes that you're gonna look at, but then even the details. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, this is, this is a, an infinitely readable 300, and 91 pages. <laughs> it could have been 3,000 yeah. and 900 pages, right? So yeah. could you talk a little bit about that process of deciding sort of what goes in big picture, but then also, you know, when do you cut off on details? Yeah, it can, you're right. And I think it would have been a less, I like to think it's a readable book. And I think it would have been a lot less readable at that 3,000 page <laughs> thing. So it's that kind of, if it were 3,000 pages though, that's the kind of thing that people give their fathers for Father's Day. <laughs> so maybe there'll be something for that. Um, so the three themes I've already mentioned. And then the challenge, like you said, Hassan, it's really true. How do you decide what to tell, what not to tell? I think it's important to me to keep the narrative running. Mm. And then the question as well, is two questions really. One is how do you do that in a way that most vividly illustrates those themes? Mm. And then the second kind of side challenge to that is how do you tell a story that people know in a way that they may not know it? Mm -hmm. So just as one example of that is towards the end of the book, obviously, I tell the story of Kent State. But I tell the story of Kent State through a reporter from the Washington Post going to one of the victim's high schools the next day. It's a high school right outside of Washington, D.C., where Allison Krauss went to high school. And he's sent by the Washington Post to write a story about this kid. And I tell it as the fact that no one in the high school knew who she was. And of course, it's a story you know, but not that side of the story. And that's the challenge. But, you know, I think that thing as a historian that you worry about is, did I cut, did I leave on the cutting room floor what I shouldn't have left on the cutting room floor? Yeah, you worry about that. You know, to pick up on the, 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 the example that you just gave of, of Krauss. So Kent State, we may not all remember or know the name Krauss, one of the victims, but we know exactly. Kent State, right? Exactly. But that's certainly, you know, a story and example that appears near the end of the book. You very easily could have started the book, yep. right, with that, but you don't start the book <laughs> with somebody who we would know or a story we would know. Right. You start with a family. Yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about who they are, but then also, why we need to, why they're yeah. seemingly just as important as Krauss. Yeah, that's, thank you for asking that. Um, 
So the story, the book starts with the story of this very, very ordinary white family on the far northwest side of Chicago um, in 1961. The, and the story actually started for me with a photo. Years and years and years ago, I found a photo, came across a photo of this family and their neighbors out on the sidewalk of the 6100 block of West Eddy Street, in case any of you want to come by, um, on the 4th of July. And they are underneath this huge array of American flags they have put up. And I was fascinated with that story, that photo. I didn't know anything about it. And then I started digging into it to find out how did these flags get here? Who are these people? And the man who set up all the flags for that celebration, his name was Ed Cahill. And I follow his family, really his wife, primarily Stella, from her birth in Chicago in 1916 forward. And the reason that I do that, besides the fact which Vicky would tell you is that I get a little fixated about people's stories. <laughs> she was really sick of hearing about the Cahills after a while. <laughs> um, is because of the math that we have a, I think the ordinary vision of the 1960s, right? Focuses on these famous people or it focuses on young people who are activists. Now that's great, that's important. And a lot of this book does that. But there are millions and millions of people who are not activists at all and who weren't young. And all you have to do is the math. Stella Gale was born in 1916, which means in the course of her growing up, she lived through the Spanish flu. And I don't say that simply because we're living through an epidemic as well. It killed her father. She lived through the Great Depression, which meant she had to leave school at 15 in order to get work because her stepfather and was unemployed. She lived through World War II where her husband of three years had, was drafted and spent two and a half years in Europe while she stayed at home with her newborn, who wasn't a newborn by the time they came home. This was a woman who lived with through the most profound challenges and changes and finally gets in the post-war world, this secure world. It's not fancy. It's Chicago bungalow belt. But it is a neighborhood that is, in fact, she wouldn't even think of it, I don't think, bounded by race, completely white neighborhood. Her husband actually works for the military industrial complex. He worked for a company called the Vacuum Can Company, which made industrial strength coffee urns. And one hunk of their sales went to the US military who liked their coffee urns. They were very parochial people, devout Catholics, like kind of the literal version of parochialism. Um, this is the world of the 1950s that I was talking about as a political configuration. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets shattered, partially. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why I want to start with their story, with a person, with people you've never heard of. I'd certainly never heard of until I started digging in their family history. And one of the nice things that you do, and I think it comes across successfully, and we see it with the Cahills, is that you, we get to revisit them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, you know, it's them individually, but often it's their neighborhood. Yeah, it is. Right. I mean, so yeah. it's, we get these, so we're introduced to this, this a family and then we're introduced to their neighborhood and then we're introduced to Chicago and then we got Mayor Daly, right. And yeah. it sort of keeps on building. Keeps coming out, back. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So that I thought, I, and I thought that reflected too, like the wonderful way you wove in both sort of national and international and very local, yeah. right? I mean, it, you know, these, these are, this is a story about people's lives, right? And people are living through this. So we, we, we are, will you introduce us to folk who we have never heard about before, but you also introduce us to folk we have all heard about, yes. <laughs> including um, presidents of the United States, right? I mean, this is, this is ground level history, and this is as high as you as high as you can get. Um, and we go through the Kennedy administration. We get we get Ike, we get Kennedy, we get LBJ, we get Nixon. Which of the presidential elections in the 1960s, in your opinion, was the most consequential? Ooh, that's a good, that's a fun question. I'd love it. We're gonna have to exchange our views on this. 
I think you can make, yeah, I have to pick one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, because 64 was fundamental in that that's the moment where the Deep South switches yeah. its allegiance, the white Deep South, obviously, but the Deep Southern states switch their allegiance to the Republican Party. So at the time, it doesn't seem to be a realigning election, but it is. 68 is an utter repudiation of the Democratic Party. It's a close election in the end, right? Because, the, because George Wallace runs as a third party candidate, he takes away 13% of the vote. But we know from the studies that political science did that if, if Wallace hadn't been in the race, two thirds of those votes would have gone to Richard Nixon. He would have won in a landslide if that had happened. Mm -hmm. And that I don't believe actually marks the beginning of, a re of the kind of conservative ascendancy. I actually don't. I think it's a, Richard Nixon runs to try to restore Eisenhower Republicanism. He just can't. <laughs> um, so now that I'm arguing with myself, I think maybe that's 64. <laughs> <my God. laughs> what did you say? I, I, I think it depends. It was a loaded question because I think- Yeah, but you asked it. I know. <laughs> I, I, and I think the answer depends on on who you're talking about, not the president, but the population. Yeah. Right. Like what that's right. For different groups of people. That's for right. women, it's a different election, right? I mean, for African Americans, it may be a different election. For that that immigrant, that immigrant yeah. group of folk, the it may be a different election. So yeah. I think that I think it depends, right? Um, but I think one of the things that you do here at that high level, which was really, which is really fascinating to read, we often think about um presidential administrations as sort of existing for their four years or eight years, and then that's it. And especially mm -hmm. if you have a change of party when you see these shifts, and then it goes on. But thinking here specifically about one of the big themes in the book and one of the big issues is the Vietnam War, and the way you weave that sort of throughout yeah. and through the different administrations and how one is picking up on the policies of another or wants to get away from it but can't and we got Eisenhower with his warnings and then yeah. Kennedy getting entrapped and then LBJ picking up. And, and I thought that was beautiful because we see that yeah in a way there are shifts in policy um, and personality but some stuff is just carried over from yeah. one to the next to the next. In a lot of ways Vietnam has its origins in 1938, mm -hmm. you know, it has its origins in Munich, you know, and I tried to make a key point of this idea that foreign policy in the United States embraces this lesson of World War II that you never appease an enemy. And that's what kind of follows through again and again and again is this sense we can't back down. Mm -hmm. the, the particular shift, obviously, um, but the idea that this isn't the Vietnam, but when I talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis, which you have a kind of obligation to write about, <laughs> I was trying to think, well, why do I need to do this besides the fact it happened? And the real key to that story to me, come, I try to make it at the very end, is that Kennedy does all the right things, actually, in the end, right? He finds a way to negotiate a deal to get back from this brink of nuclear war. And he's under enormous pressure to escalate. The Joint Chiefs, is pushing him to escalate in the most dramatic way possible. And he hides what he's done. And that's the most revealing moment that you have actually achieved world, you've pulled the United States back from the brink of nuclear war and you don't dare admit it mm. because that would make you look weak. And that tells you something so much about the mindset that leads you into a Vietnam. When Lyndon Johnson in 65 is saying, the military is crazy, we're, this is crazy. I don't know why we're doing this. But he does it. And that's a remarkable power of that much bigger framework that says we will never go back to 1938 and how much that weighs on American foreign policy. So we have silences offered by Kennedy in this instance, as you yeah. write about with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. But then but then further on, and we'll move off presidents in a second. Then, <laughs> then further on, a little bit later on with Nixon, yeah. we, have a, we have public silences as well, but for, but for completely different reasons and motivations. One could look at that and say, is this like sort of the schizophrenia of 
American politics? I mean, wh where is, is there a through line of consistency that actually leads us to a better place? Or is it just, I'm trying to survive yeah. at that high level. And if that means I keep secrets from the American public or I do things that uh, are, are, are actually uh, either unconstitutional or beyond my powers, LBJ and Gulf of Tonkin yeah. or Nixon, is that really, because we're seeing it time and time and time again, is that really what we're dealing with here? I think, I think we see consistency. What we don't see in this thread is moving to a better place. Um, and I was surprised as I was writing the book how much Dwight Eisenhower hangs over the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Because I, it was not my concept of Dwight Eisenhower. But he does because what he does is he sets a framework that, especially in foreign policy, that says we can pursue, we will pursue Cold War policies, but we'll take them off the front pages. We'll push them into the secrets. We'll push them into the shadows. So the United States overthrows the government of Guatemala. The United States overthrows the government of Iran. The United States really, really wanted to overthrow the government of Cuba. And it's all hidden. And what you do is you make sure troops never go in. You never send ground troops. That's Dwight Eisenhower's mantra. Americans don't want to see their sons killed in a foreign battlefield. They have no stomach for it. So don't let that happen. Because you can do all sorts of other stuff that you don't let them see. That's what Lyndon Johnson breaks. I mean, he does all sorts of secret stuff, but he sends the troops. That's the, he breaks the Eisenhower rule. And what Nixon tries to do is restore it. Get rid of the troops out of Vietnam as fast as you possibly can. Bomb the hell out of them. We don't care. Americans actually have a very high tolerance for air wars, mm. but they don't have a high tolerance for our ground troops. And we see that consistency to this day. What was it? that Barack Obama built, you know, a lot of his foreign policy around was drone warfare. That's Dwight Eisenhower policy. You know, you can take very aggressive actions. Don't let Americans see their sons or now their sons and daughters come home in flag draped coffins. And that was the, that was the rule that Lyndon Johnson broke. Beyond the the end of the 1960s, right? Whenever we mark that and we're yes. in the Nixon administration. So when that ends, looking forward to today, and as you were writing this, and certainly as I was, as I was reading in, those who have had a chance to read it, um, whenever you read, I think, I think whenever you read history, uh, you're reading it for the time, but you're also reading it in the moment. Yeah. Um, and there's so much in here that still that resonates with the moment. And one of the things, one of the threads throughout um, are issues of women's liberation, issues of uh, women's reproductive rights. Yeah. You walk us through Roe v. Wade and how yeah. it comes about. And I couldn't help but read that and then obviously think about the current mm -hmm. moment where we are at a point where there's a strong possibility, if not likelihood, that that will be overturned. Yeah. Um, what are, wh in, in some of these threads, some of these stories, what do you see as some of the principal legacies of this moment in American history that we that still remain unresolved, that are on the brink of being turned over, uh, yeah. that we thought were, you know, sort of permanent but aren't, are being yeah. shattered? Yes. Yeah. Partially. Volume two. Volume two. <laughs> That's an idea. Um, <laughs> I think all three of the, I did not intend this when I set out, but I think all three of those themes, of the themes of the book, speak directly to that. Mm -hmm. Significant change came. And I'd love to hear your take. I think I know your take, but I'd love to talk a bit more about that. There was significant change in the American racial regime in the 1960s. Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, are significant changes. It obviously was not everything that the movement wanted, but they're real accomplishments. They're stunning accomplishments in my mind. 
But of course, we live with the racial question to this day of all the things that weren't resolved. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about the urban rebellions of the 1960s of Watts and Newark and Detroit. Every single one of them was started by an act of police brutality. That's an issue, one of many issues on the racial front that we have not solved. And you could see the continuities of that. Roe is a stunning transformation of American law and American legal practices. So really the theme of the sexuality theme is about the regulation of sexuality. That's a stunning change. And there is every reason to believe that that's going to be overturned mm -hmm. in the next few months. And then the continuities of foreign policy, just think about last summer, just think about the Afghanistan pullout and all that went with that and how reminiscent that was of the concept, I mean, obviously the entire Afghanistan process was a process of nation building. It was exactly the same process that the United States engaged in in Vietnam. Well, not exactly, but it's very similar to the process they engaged in in Vietnam. And the end result is the same kind of profound ambiguity of Vietnam. So I'm not saying there's a straight through line. I mean, 50 years is a long time. There's a lot of stuff happens in between the end of the 1960s and today. but the resonance, there are through lines. That resonance is still there. I'm giving a guest lecture in a class on Thursday. And you know, parts of it are even written now. Um, <laughs> the ride home tomorrow. Um, and it's tracing out, the idea is anyways, tracing out the white backlash mm -hmm. against civil rights, the civil rights breaks through is 63, 64, 65 and how reminiscent our current backlash is mm. over questions of critical race theory, for instance. Now, obviously no one in 1965 was talking about critical race theory, but the dynamics are mm. incredibly similar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the 60s still matter mm -hmm. because you know it's a long, long time ago, um, but the issues that were central to that decade then, and there are issues I don't talk about because I excluded them, that have the same resonance, right? Environmentalism kind of comes to mind, that then carry, that we still live with in some form or another. What did the process of writing the shattering teach you about the 60s? It taught me a lot, actually. I think one of the things that I feel that I learned, maybe y'all are gonna say, well, duh, but, you asked about me, <laughs> so maybe it's all really obvious to you, the rest of you, is there are these really dramatic liberal and radical movements of the 1960s, but the strength of American conservatism mm. is enormous mm. in the 1960s. So one of the th arguments I'm making, and I don't make a big deal of it, but it's important to me, is that there wasn't an anti-war movement in the United States, there were three. There was the radical anti-war movement, you know, the people associate with SDS. There was a liberal anti-war movement people associate with, say, Gene McCarthy or Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King, but uh, he might actually be on the radical one. Right. Um, then there's a conservative one. 1967, 20% of Americans wanted the United States to use nuclear weapons on North Vietnam. The quarter, not a quarter, it's 20% of the population wanted, and more than half of Americans, at that time wanted an escalation of the war in Vietnam. Because what they really wanted was a very quick, very fast war that would give them a victory and get everybody home. Mm. And that story has been lost completely because we've got our set ideas of this. So that's part of the reason why I keep coming back to that same thought of a partial shattering is because there are these dramatic movements and they make dramatic change and people do dramatic things and they sacrifice enormously for them. And they make a difference. That's why in, in my mind, I insist that the civil rights revolutions of 64, 65 made a difference because I think it does some disrespect for the people who risked their lives and sacrificed their lives to make those mm -hmm. changes. But there was also enormous pushback and enormous resistance. And that was kind of a revelation to me. 
I want us to get ready to take some questions from the, from the audience. Uh, and so get your, I'm gonna ask one more question, but get your thoughts together. And then are we gonna pass the microphone or come up? So we'll get that, we'll get that ready. Um, and as we prepare, as we prepare that, um, I wanna ask you, did, we meet a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and again, right, from the Cahills to presidents, right? I mean, top to bottom. Who, you know, after writing and researching um, for this book, was, was there somebody um, who at the end of it, you were like, you know what? I kind of like this person a little bit more. So either somebody you met or somebody you knew before. And it was just like, oh, I just, I'm thinking of them differently now. Mm, that's a great question. So of course, I re so I did meet the Cahills, not Stella and Ed who are passed on, but their daughter, Judy, um, who gave me a lot of the kind of family info. And she's just a lovely person. And I sent her the book and I haven't heard back from her and I'm really sort of worried. Um, <laughs> honestly, I am sort of worried. Um, I don't think I said anything that she didn't want me to say. Um, but it just makes me a little nervous. Maybe she just thought, oh, 300 pages. <laughs> she could have read the first chapter and stop. Um, you know whose story I found most powerful mm -hmm. in writing, which isn't quite your question, yeah, yeah. I realized, but the one that I found most, two of them really, is Alison Krauss's three. Mm -hmm. Alison Krauss's story, Elizabeth Eckford's story, she is mm -hmm. the young woman who um, misses the call. She's one of the Little Rock Nine. And she misses the call the morning to come with the others to school. She says she walks to Little Rock High alone. And you capture that story beautifully. Oh, thank right? you. <laughs> you just really, we're walking with her. You're walking with it's her. Really, it's really well done. And Norma McCorvey, mm. who is Jane Rowe. Um, and that was a really powerful story to me. I think because she is, was, she's recently died. Um, she's not an easy figure. Mm. And those are the most powerful stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have some uh, questions? Feel free to make your, your way to the microphone. Hi, welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about the change in uh, information and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, communication. That's uh, great. I think back to the 60s where there you, you didn't have instant, obviously, communication the way you do now. You also had control by elites uh, that, you know, if there are positives and negatives to that change, but it feels profound. <laughs> so I That's was great. wondering if you look back so closely at the 60s, if you were thinking, oh gosh, today, this would go in a different direction because of the storm, the media storm or the Twitter storm or, or these, it's amazing how these, how did these people get together without Facebook <laughs> um, to organize, or, you know, just, just reflections on that change. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I have a really ambivalent sense of that um, because you're, you know, how could I disagree with you that we have lived through this revolution in communication. I think very few of you in this room are old enough to remember having a phone hanging on your wall. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. I just want to make that clear. That I, I got that. Um, and that, you know, you didn't have an answering machine. So like, you know, in my, the rule in my family was it had to ring 10 times. Um, you let a phone ring 10 times before you gave up because um, we're a very persistent family. Um, so obviously there are profound changes. And God knows, it's a great question, but God knows how some of the events of the 1960s would have played differently in an era of instant communication. On the other hand, mm. we are also, all of us in the room, well, that's not true, but most of us in the room, Anna, you don't count on this at all, <laughs> are of a generation who grew up with television. So we think of it as kind of a given, but remember that people like my parents, my parents didn't grow up with a television. So television was as startling to those people as say the internet was for us, right? As Instagram was when 
that was introduced, right? And it had this amazing power. I believe the most important moment, I actually do, the most important moment of the post-war era is Birmingham in 1963, mm. because it bursts open everything. Without what happened in Birmingham in 63, all those other, that's when the floodgates open by the political power that's released by the children in Birmingham in the spring of 1963. And that's a television event. You know, there's that famous footage from Eyes on the Prize where whatever the guy's name is, the white power broker who says, they only marched a block, which is true. <laughs> they did, they marched a block from the 16th Street Baptist Church across Kelly Ingram Park and they got hit by water hoses. <laughs> it's a television moment. And it had such power because people like Stella Cahill, right? Born in 1916. You weren't used to seeing the news on a couple hours delay in your living room. Mm. And it had the same power for them as some of the media does for us today. Now it's true, it, what you said also, and it's an important point, it was controlled. You know, you had three networks, unless you lived a wildlife like I did. I was born and raised in Detroit, so we had four because we got the Canadian station. You know, so it was obviously a much different venue, but I think the, the kind of personal power of the media was maybe just as great it, because it was in a you know it was in a different age. Other questions? Make your way up to the mic. Um, and as we oh here we go. Um, so I also had a question about uh, relation between kind of end of the '60s and the present day, and and this title, the shattering. Um, so you know I've I have heard people. Uh, okay, you know, say, oh, you know, 68 was a, a terrible time. It just felt like everything was coming apart. And as someone who you know, was five then, so I've learned the, the 60s all through history. And, it, you know, it seems like, gosh, 60s were great. You know, there was all this progressive politics, music, and so forth. And I, and I found it hard to, hard to understand that notion of, you know, 68 seeming like a, a terrible time. But, you know, I also, I think like, you know, many of us feel right now, like, Gosh, I'm really, you know, quite worried about the country shattering. Uh, yes. You know, maybe not just partially. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, and and things feel, you know, very momentous and frightening. And and I, you know, so I, I it at least helps me kind of imagine how some people yeah. might have, have felt at the end of the '60s. But I'm interested in your sense of, you know, first of all. Do you think the, the way people feel about the current political moment is also like a lot of people felt at the mm -hmm. end of the 60s? Mm -hmm. And secondly, you know, do you think that that's an accurate view or that you know, things are either not as bad or considerably worse? Today? Yeah. Okay. So how much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's, those are really fascinating questions. Yes, I think that people in the late 1960s, um, two particular moments in the spring and summer of 1968, mm -hmm. particularly, um, and then again, maybe even more strongly in the spring of 1970. Mm -hmm. the, the, in, and again, it comes back to something you said a little while ago, depends who you were, mm -hmm. but the level of social breakdown right after Kent State was just extraordinarily intense in the United States. Um, so those two periods, I think people did have a really great fear. I have a story about 1968. Maybe I'll quickly share with you. Yeah, um, I think I mentioned it in the book, but it just has struck me. So as, so I, as I mentioned a little while ago, and as people will tell you, I mentioned way too often, um, I'm originally from Detroit. In 1968, in 67, Detroit had the biggest urban rebellion of the, 19th, of the 20th century, except for LA. Um, and... In 68, the newspapers in Detroit, in the spring of 68, the newspapers in Detroit went on strike. And so the mayor of Detroit decided to set up a rumor control center. So you could call in and say, I just heard such and such. Is it true? Because he feared that the racial tensions in Detroit were so high that rumors would spin out of control without a morning paper. There was actually a morning and an afternoon paper without papers. And they got about 100 calls a day in the spring of 68 until Martin Luther King was murdered. And then for the next few days after Martin Luther King was murdered, the number of phone calls shot up to over a thousand a day. 
most of them from the from the Detroit suburbs, from the mm -hmm. white suburbs. And I've looked at the records of that. They're, they're available in the archives. The most common rumor of those days that this rumor control center got was that on the Friday after Martin Luther King's murder, and that's not an insignificant fact, so I mention it, the Friday after his funeral, which happened that year to be Good Friday, Black people were going to march on the suburbs and kill all the white children. Now you just got to stop for one second and think what that story is. That's the Passover. That was the most common rumor in Detroit that year, that spring, which tells you something about the level of white fear mm -hmm. and white paranoia and something about the terror people felt of what was happening in society. Now, your second question, I was not particularly old in 1968 either. So I'm also building on a um, historical, my reading of history rather than any personal memories. But if you look at the, I think this is a more dangerous situation. You know, if you think about Richard Nixon, and I am not a, I don't think I'm gentle on Richard Nixon <laughs> in the book. Richard Nixon believed enough in the rule of law to resign. And that's a very big difference. In a democracy, that's a very, very dangerous difference. When you mentioned the, um, and please, if you have questions, come up, um, the rumors, Black folk are going to march on the uh, on the suburbs one that fear of they're going to kill the kids it, it speaks to the anti-busing yeah. sort of spirit oh, that that, that yes. you talk about here that, yeah. that comes up a little later yeah but the resonances the echoes of that just go back to the last campaign when donald trump is like they're coming to the black folk are yep. coming to your suburbs right yep i mean that has yep. deep roots right and it's like what does that mean? no that ties into these things oh my god I am so happy you brought that, well, not happy, but you know what I mean? I, because when Donald Trump made those claims about the suburbs, which he did in the court in September and October of last year, mm -hmm. what the newspapers did and the magazine, the pundits did is they say, they said, oh, he's hearkening back to some imaginary 1950 suburbs. Mm -hmm. He was not, he was hearkening back to 1968 mm -hmm. and 69 and 70. That's the world he's from. He's not from the suburbs of 1950. He's from Queens, for God's sake. He came of age in that mm -hmm. period. That's what he was hearkening back to, that fear. And that kind of adds to, I think, this. That, yeah. I mean, so I will just say on top of what I was saying about the idea of democracy, because I've been working on this lecture for the next couple of days about the white backlash. In the, 19, in the early 1960s, polling data showed that about 80% of white people said they believed that black and white people were, or of the way they phrased it was, black people were as intelligent as white people. Mm. So 70, about 80% of Americans didn't want to say, white Americans, we believe in white supremacy in the early 1960s. I think that percentage is smaller now. Mm. And that's a terrifying turn. Mm -hmm. I am just a ray of light in here. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a question from, from, yes. from online? Yes, we have several. Um, what advice do you have for high school teachers who are teaching this time period? Could you speak specifically to the romanticization that often happens in students' minds with respect to the 60s? Yeah. That's a great question. I, um, um, I take it as my kind of personal crusade to attack the romanticism of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to see this as a period of struggle and of very intense violence. And that the gains that were made, again, significant gains came at enormous costs. Was it a period that was great fun 
Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, I just don't think that that's the important issues of the 1960s. And just as a small aside, and I, I just like to say this, I am very proud, so I'm gonna kill my book sales right now, um, <laughs> to say that I wrote an entire book in the 1960s that does not mention Bob Dylan, <laughs> <laughs> but does mention Bobby Vinton. Mm. Like two people in the room, like, who the hell is he? <laughs> <laughs> the Polish Prince, number one hit, 1963. <laughs> What? Oh God, now I'm showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, someone Google that. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 uh, if, if, yeah. And not much sports. No, that was a, that was a weakness. I'll admit that. Actually, there's a really, there could be some really great sports stories I know. there. Even the, you know, Detroit in the, in, yeah, in the, the, the World Series in 68. Kurt Flood. Yeah. Have been, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, Linda. So this is a question from Kevin Flaherty online. Can you describe any examples of the resistance and pushback from conservatives that you witnessed as a child? Oh my goodness. As a child. All right. This is not really quite an answer to that because it's more complicated than a conservative liberal thing. Um, so I lived in a completely white neighborhood in Detroit. I grew up in a completely white neighborhood in the city, um, but a completely white neighborhood. And when I was, I don't remember how old I was, maybe 12 or so, the first African-American family moved down to my neighborhood, down to my block. Um, nothing happened. You know, nice people, I think. Um, Second black family moved out to the block a little while. I don't remember the timing. Third black family moved on to the block and the entire white neighborhood fled, as did my parents. And I look back at that as one of, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that living through that experience and when my family left, I was 17. When my family left, I was starting my senior year of high school when my family left that neighborhood as part of white flight. Um, I, think my, I think it's probably fair to say that nothing has shaped my academic and scholarly career than that experience. Mm -hmm. Did your understanding of that change or how has that changed over time? Um, I was old enough so that it wasn't a matter of, oh, my parents know what they're doing and I'm just moving. We didn't, I didn't move to a new school. Uh, the, my parents did move to the suburbs because I was in parochial school, so it wasn't following a city line. So that probably would have made a big difference. It ever, probably would have killed them if I had had to change <laughs> schools in my senior year. Um, but I was old enough not to take what was happening as kind of just a given, right? Mm -hmm. That I, I think we, I had never lived anywhere else. I'd lived in this, this is the house that I had always lived in. I felt this enormous sense of loss of in this very tight knit community with tons of the kids I grew up with. Um, it felt even at the time kind of needless. What was the point of doing this? Um, but yes, my understanding of it has changed because I had no sense whatsoever of the kind of structural forces mm -hmm. of racism as it runs through cities. Um, to put it another way, Hassan, I could have really used the critical race theory perspective yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that time. So yeah, I think I have a better understanding of it. Um, but it wasn't, as I said, it wasn't a moment that I, at the time, that I said, you know, oh, of course, you know. Yeah, right. Um, we're up against the clock uh, and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So perhaps I'll end with um, a question for you and thinking about your readers. Um, what would you like for us to sort of take away um, after reading The Shattering beyond just sort of a new familiarity and meeting new people but big picture, we, you know, you finally close the book and put it down and say, huh, like what, what do you hope is percolating in our mind? One of the things is, you know, 
every bit as well as I do, is you put a book out there and you can't really always say how people are going to read it and what they're going to take away from it. And that's great. That's part of the process. I think what I would like people to come away from this book, if I could control how they read it, is to come away with a deep sense of the ambiguity mm -hmm. of the 1960s, that the kind of sharp, sometimes even easy judgments we make. It was a fun period. Everybody was a hippie. They really, really weren't. <laughs> um, everybody marched with Dr. King. They really, really mm -hmm. didn't. Um, so people did. I'm not trying to minimize that, but not as many people as think they did. That it was a dramatic moment of straightforward progress, yeah. or that it was a dramatic moment where everything went to hell. It's set all that aside and see it as an ambiguous product of deeply human, flawed, ambitious, idealistic, deeply human people, which I suppose is a way of saying that's what I would want anyone to take away from a history book. Mm -hmm. Well, it is an amazing book. It is wonderfully written. It'll be, once you pick it up, you will not put it down. Thank you for writing it. And thank you for coming back and for sharing it with us. Thank Kevin you, Boyd. Thank you. Um, I echo what uh, Hassan has just said about the book. It's remarkable. And I thank both of you, Kevin and Hassan, for a wonderful um, conversation, uh, a lot to think about. Uh, Kevin will be signing books in the back, so um, some informal conversations uh, to be had. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. That was so much fun. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. That was awesome. And thanks for the book, man. Very good. Oh, get your mic, please. Hi. Oh, hey. It's nice to see you. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. I think. Yeah.